It's deliberate that the way that the Israelis represent themselves in American media pulls on this sort of collective memory of the dispossession and the slaughter of Native Americans in North America. The concept of America as a city on a hill, as something that represents Judeo-Christian values. We all can see this hypocrisy. How do you get to the point where this violence is even something that someone would think was an okay thing to do. The idea that liberalism has nothing to do structurally with racism uh, is a historical revisionist project. Okay. When it comes to secular liberalism, there is a necessary violence. Our dead are heroes and your dead are, are terrorists. When we consider the stance of the West over Israel's actions these past weeks, many point out the blatant hypocrisy in applying these standards. We are constantly told that human rights are inviolable, that freedom of speech is sacrosanct, and that people have the right to self-determination. Westerners sermonize about how Muslims should embrace democratic norms. They pontificate about the rules-based liberal world order, where rules are applied fairly and equally. Yet in these past weeks, anyone with a conscience would note that these calls ring hollow. We all can see this hypocrisy. But are the West negligent of their ideals? Are they acting in contrary to their liberal values? It is said if only they were brought to the right path once again. My guest today is Imam Tom Fakini, who argues the West is acting perfectly in line with their worldview. Imam Tom finished his BA in political science and was granted the opportunity to study at the Islamic University of Medina, where he obtained his BA from the Faculty of Sharia. Imam Tom is the research director of Islam and Society at Yakin Institute for Islamic Research. He's also a resident scholar and Imam of Utica Masjid in New York State. Imam Tom Fakini, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and welcome back to the Thinking Muslim. Alaikum salam wa Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Well, it's wonderful to have you with us uh, once again. I think the last time we spoke, we were uh, we were face to face in Istanbul. Uh, but uh, inshallah ta'ala, we I hope to meet you again uh, sometime soon when you come to Britain. Yes, inshallah. Maybe perhaps in the spring. Perhaps in the spring, inshallah. Wonderful. Now, when we talk uh, about what's happened in the last few weeks, I mean it's it's very sorrowful. Um, we're talking on a Tuesday and the news is coming in of a horrendous slaughter at uh, Al Ahli Hospital. Hundreds seem to have died and we have witnessed this past week mass murder of our brothers and sisters in Gaza. Now I want to explore Western hypocrisy today. Can we start with the American scene? In the UK the media supported a very uniform Israeli analysis but over the past week that somewhat shifted as people observe the cruelty uh, with which the Israeli state prosecutes their barbarism. But my understanding of, the, of America is that the media has largely ignored Palestinian suffering and instead echoed Israeli sound bites. Imam Tom, what accounts for this? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salat salam rasulillah. Um, so I think that that's a, a fair observation. Um, with the caveat that there is a large uh, distinction to be made between traditional media outlets such as the nightly news and newspapers versus sort of new media, social media and things like that. Once you get, um, you know, folks my age and younger tend to get their news from Twitter and other sort of social media outlets. Um, and the terrain is, it's much more of a fair fight uh, on at least the non-meta owned outlets. Um, mm -hmm. But even on the ones that are owned by Meta, there is much more space for alternative views uh, to come through. It, it's been quoted several times here about uh, people remarking, well, the Israelis are telling us what to believe or what's going on, and the Palestinians are showing us what's going on. Um, so there are opportunities. However, when it comes to the traditional media, folks that are sort of in their 50s and older, um, the types of media that they're used to consuming, the, the news, the newspapers, the traditional media outlets, yes, the, there is much more unity on uh, these sort of Israeli talking points. And that goes across the board, whether it's left or right. Uh, CNN is a veritable mouthpiece for the, uh, for the Israeli government at this point. I know someone observed, I think it was, uh, I believe, it, I can't remember who it was on Twitter, who observed that for two solid hours, um, CNN, the other day, CNN had completely uninterrupted 
coverage from Israeli perspectives, Zionist perspectives, uh, not a single Palestinian voice on. Uh, it was, you know, the, the literally turning the mic over to military commanders and letting them paint the picture, letting them set the discourse, letting them, you know, um, bring up personalized stories that, that tug on the heartstrings and, and emotions and basically um, letting them do what they want, like the kids' gloves, right, when it comes to uh, these sorts of uh, figures. When the, the Palestinian cause can't get in a word edgewise. Um, and there's some, there's some interesting, I think there's a unique constellation of, uh, or convergence of factors that, that account for this when it comes to the American scene. Um, I could point to, I think, two broad categories, the first of which is discursive, um, and the second of which is material, right? So there are discursive mm -hmm. factors and there are material factors. And anybody who's studied political science, you'll recognize that most of the political theory is, you know, goes between these two camps, the discursive camp with Foucault and, and then the materialist camp with, with Marx. Um, when it comes to the discursive factors, one of the most important discursive um, sort of languages that is recognizable immediately in America is the settler colonial dynamic. This is something that someone had quoted recently as being almost a reflex, and it's deliberate. It's deliberate that the way that the Israelis represent themselves in American media pulls on this sort of collective memory of the dispossession and the slaughter of Native Americans in North America. Really? When it comes to the whole idea of the the frontier and the borderlands and people who are sort of deputized in in sort of um, in a way where they're they have weapons and they're trying to supposedly pull themselves up by their bootstraps and work hard and and do something to propagate the land and make the desert bloom and all this sort of language that's used it's it's almost a carbon copy of the discourse that was used to justify Manifest Destiny, the expansion of American colonial settlers across uh, across North America, and justify the slaughter and dispossession of the Native Americans whenever wherever they went. Um, so this is something of a reflex. It's something that's much more familiar to the American sort of political consciousness than it is to the European political consciousness, even though obviously the European situation is very, very familiar with colonization. But there's something particular about the settler dynamic um, that has an extra, I think, currency uh, when it comes to the American context. We also, the second discursive factor that I would point to is the fact that the United States is not yet as secularized as many places within Europe. The, the religiosity, even though it's cratering, even though it's tanking, even though many Christian denominations are in retreat, there is still much more religiosity. And so the Christian mythology, and particularly the Christian political mythology that has been crafted in the last hundred years, or the last 200 years even, uh, is, is, uh, is appealed to, and successfully so. The concept of America as a city on a hill, as something that represents Judeo-Christian values, even though that's a historically nonsensical category, the Christians were the worst oppressors of the Jews. Um, and then obviously we have the, the contingent of evangelical Christians who believe in this sort of... Uh, millenarian sort of uh, doctrine or ideology that the, the temple is going to be rebuilt and we're moving towards the last days and actually that the state of Israel and Zionism itself is an important component within realizing their sort of religious and spiritual goals. That is something that is fairly particular to the United States. We also have other things that I think are more common, but they, they, they join the river. These are all tributaries that flow into a larger river for what makes that, what sets the, 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 the scene when it comes to discourse and how it is spoken and how it is heard and experienced within the United States. Um, the clash of civilizations is obviously a big one, right? The idea that Islam is this, um, you know, this perennial foe to the Christian, to the Christendom, right? Or to the Christian uh, polity, something that territorially still has more purchase probably in Europe than in the Americas, but ideologically and religiously might have more purchase in the United States where, again, people tend to be a, a bit more religious, haven't yet completely let go. Uh, you have the democracy narrative, right? So the idea that the United States is has a, again, a manifest destiny, sort of a divine charge to spread, quote unquote, democracy wherever it goes, uh, quote unquote, leader of the free world. These are all discourses that are weaponized, that are utilized and that are appealed to through Israeli talking points and how the media is constructed. Um, and then we also have, of course, 
and this is more, uh, much more close and familiar to the European context, the racialization and the civilizational discourse of who is civilized and who is not, and who must be civilized um, through violence even. Uh, who is racialized as the other. Obviously, it's no coincidence that even within the, you know, quote unquote Israel, which is really Palestine, that there is a racialization of the ruling regime there, that the European Jews are treated in a completely favorable manner compared to other historically, you know, like Arab Jews or other Jews from other Ethiopian Jews, people from different parts of the world. So there is a racialization there where it, when people look in the mirror and we had some of the quotes that were coming through the mainstream news when it was, and I know we'll talk about Russia and Ukraine, where people put their foots in their mouths by, by taking the mask off and saying, well, we're so surprised because they look like us. They have white skin, they have blonde hair, they have blue eyes. People were saying that honestly when it came to Ukraine and Russia. Well, here's the situation where you have Palestinians who don't look like you. They're not, they don't have blonde hair, blue eyes, or light skin. And then you have you know, European descended Jews that have claimed their sort of stake in Israel as their project that look that do you know uh, look much more like sort of the quote unquote normative American you know that white supremacy would uphold as the the norm and the desirable norm that this is all part of the discursive landscape of how things are heard and how violence is authorized and this is going to be a a, a theme and a phrase that we're going to repeat several times in this interview how violence is authorized how can someone get to the point where they're willing to drop a bomb on a hospital that has 300 people inside of it how is it how do we get to the point where uh, you are able to, I just had a, a talk with someone on a local talk radio that was refusing to condemn the use of chemical weapons against Palestinians. How do you get to the point where this violence is even something that someone would uh, think was a, an okay thing to do? How is that violence authorized? These are all factors that contribute to how this author, this violence is authorized. <coughs> there are really other- wonderful, yeah. Go for it. No, no, no please go. Uh, I mean, these are really wonderful points and, and actually, it, it allows us, enables us to understand the American scene very well. But, you know, last time we spoke, we had a very deep discussion about liberalism and in many ways how liberalism uh, was, um, or at least it's pre presented as uh, an ideology, a belief system, which should have resolved some of these uh, contentions of human civilization. For example, uh, the idea that human beings are equal and the idea that, you know, we live in a in a world where uh, there is um, some form of r racial hierarchy is now a thing of the past, right? Uh, is there a problem with just how much uh, America has embraced the ideals of liberalism, as opposed to say in some parts of Europe where uh, it seems like at least you know in some places like Ireland there is a a far deeper conscience. And and some put that down to the fact that Ireland has liberalized far greater than maybe other European countries. Um, yeah, what's your what's your take on that? The idea that liberalism has nothing to do structurally with racism uh, is a historical revisionist project. Okay, uh, even just from the the, the years in which these. Uh, these ideologies were being developed. Liberalism was right alongside colonialism and racism and everything that was part of the quote unquote long 19th century, right? If you go back to the founders of liberalism, to John Locke, John Locke was a slaveholder. He had stake in the North Atlantic slaves trade. He wrote the, the laws for the, and was an advocate for the sugar slave trade in Barbados. And then he took, when he was writing about freedom in his treatises that people quote in college campuses, he was not writing about black freedom. He was not writing about the freedom of everybody. He was writing about white settler col colonizer freedom. And that was actually explicitly exported to South Carolina, where he wrote the state constitution, and then brought into America in general. So when these people were writing, they were not writing for everybody. This is structural, a structural relationship between liberalism and colonialism and racism. When you have a sort of an ideal of liberalism and what it stands for, individual and autonomy and all these sorts of things, you're inherently creating an illiberal other. That illiberal other is always the subject or rather the object of legitimate violence. 
People have a mythology that they believe, that they believe that liberalism made the world less violent. That couldn't be less true. It simply shifted the violence. It, they have also a myth that they believe in that liberalism made the world more free. That's also not true. It only shifted the pattern of, of constraint, right? And so when we talk about liberalism, or whether we need more of it, liberalism is structurally um, can, is structurally condemned to being imbued with these qualities and tied up with these other projects. It's nonsensical. Colonialism is a practice of liberalism. It's a nonsensical to imagine that we simply need more liberalism when liberalism was responsible for the worst atrocities of colonialism. Not saying that colonialism in the very, we're talking about early 1500s, 1600s, you know, this was maybe we could say a pre-liberal colonialism, one that was maybe about just extraction of resources and about conversions and things like that. But once we get to the 17 and especially the 1800s, that is liberalism at its peak. That is peak liberalism. Colonialism as a, as a practice, as a log logical conclusion of liberalism. Why are Palestinian lives less valuable than Israeli lives? Because of liberalism, because Palestinians are not liberal. They're not people who believe in just individual rights and individual autonomy and the progress of civilizations. They believe in Allah. They believe that there was a, a, a paradigmatically superior generation at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the past, right? Mm -hmm. They are people who because of their beliefs and their illiberal, uh, what we, illiberality, maybe we could call it, that they actually make themselves legitimate targets of violence under the liberal scheme. So the idea that we could have more liberalism and figure our way out of this with being more liberal is simply hypocritical. And the things that redeem nations like the Irish and nations even like South America is not the fact that they're liberal or more liberal. It's the fact that they've experienced colonial violence and so they can relate to it. If the United States of America has a colonizer reflex, then Ireland has an anti-colonial reflex because it was, there is a saying within post-colonial theory that the colonizer has to colonize at home first before he can go colonize abroad. And Ireland was exactly that. We don't have to go through the history. Everybody in the UK, I expect, and I I hope knows the history, right? So this idea is nonsensical. Liberalism is what got us into this place. And I have a discussion elsewhere. You've probably seen it, you know, in the, the history of philosophical liberalism or the idea of philosophical liberalism. And we can talk maybe more about it. But liberalism as an ideology came to remedy certain problems that it identified. But it is a human-based ideology, not based on the divine guidance, not based on divine morality. And so it provided a solution to the previous problems that created more problems in and of themselves. And we can maybe go into that, but I'll give a chance for you to interject. No, no, exactly. Okay. So, um, but then some would say that um, there are liberals who don't act in this supremacist way that you describe. You know, we have had demonstrations, protests across the world uh, in recent days. Uh, alhamdulillah, in, in Britain, in the UK, we had multiple demonstrations. The London demonstration was uh, had many thousands of, of people attending, many non-Muslims attending, and they would call themselves liberals. Uh, and so they may argue or may suggest, well, that's not me. You're painting a picture of someone who believes in a supremacy, but I don't, I don't believe in that, and I stand with my Palestinian brothers and sisters. How do you explain that dichotomy between some liberals who believe in a a a worldview which you know is more closer to the uh, I don't know the stereotype, and then other liberals like Joe Biden who are egging on the Israeli state to cause more slaughter. Right. Well, people are complicated, right? People mm -hmm. are not uh, completely black and white or a hundred percent for whatever particular ideology or worldview they espouse, right? So even if we come to Muslims, right? There are some mu Muslims who are internally colonized and, and some of your, your questions that you share with me actually get into that about, you know, foreign ideologies or secular ideologies that have colonized us and shape our thinking, right? So uh, nobody's 100% anything. And I, I take this, this is probably my biggest rev revelation from from listening to uh, Sami Hamdi a lot the, la the past week <laughs> when he was talking about, um, this isn't a, an issue of of civilizational clash and it's not mm. necessarily an issue of us versus them i mean that has components of that but the biggest and most important thing is that this is a clash of truth versus falsehood and the people who are sincere and the people who have clean hearts and that care about justice mm. even if it contradicts their liberal 
their liberal commitments. They can understand and they can recognize and they can appreciate that truth is on the side of the Palestinians and truth is on the side of the Muslims in this particular context. They might have nodes of commonality, right? Nobody is saying, you know, uh, people have this misconception of the Sharia as well, where they say, well, you know, everything that's haram is 100% bad. That's not true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah that alcohol has benefit to it, and yet it's haram, because the harm outweighs the good. Well, the same with liberalism, you know, talking about if there's certain things such as justice or such as the idea of certain types of equality, there might be goods, right, that are part of liberalism. We're not, you know, trying to make it seem like it's it's all bad. However, when it comes to the the history of the thing and the structural practice of the thing, like liberalism is not just a bunch of ideas on a page. It's also a set of practices that have been etched into time and space, right? And Islam is something that basically attempts to solve the problems that liberalism attempted to solve, but solves it in complete ways with divine guidance in ways that don't have any externalities or excesses or follies, right? Or uh, we could say, unintended consequences, the ones that liberalism has had, right? So it's not, we shouldn't be surprised when we see people who are genuine people, who are sincere people. They identify as liberals, that's great. And they say that, you know, yes, I'm on the side of the Palestinians, this is wrong, et cetera, et cetera. They have something alive in them that actually is the overlap, we could say, if you were to make a Venn diagram, that there's something that overlaps with Islam, that their love of justice or their love, their, their, um, their willingness to support the oppressed, their hatred of injustice, that this is that part of that Venn diagram that, that overlaps with Islam. And that's a really useful point to try to bring people in and say, well, this is what Islam stands for. It stands for justice, just like you stand for justice. But maybe our ideas or conceptualizations of justice are not 100% overlapping, but we can agree to this. And so that should definitely be welcomed. We started this conversation, Imam Tom, by discussing uh, hypocrisy and how do we understand this Western hypocrisy? And uh, it comes to my mind that in the past week and a half, uh, international law has been cited as one of the key reasons why Israel is conducting itself in an inappropriate way. Yet uh, many of the Western leaders, I mean here, both sides of the Atlantic, find it very difficult to censure Israel according to those laws, for example, the Geneva Convention or, or other such laws that are enshrined within the UN system. How do we understand the lack of application of these conventions and laws that we call international laws? People have a problem with tribalism, which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it in the Quran, even when it comes to Musa salam and his story, right? Before he is commissioned as a prophet, he encounters a uh, a situation going on, a skirmish mm. uh, in, in his city. And he is invited to jump into the conflict on the side of his tribe, only to find out that this was a mistake, that the person who was uh, in violation of what was right was the person on their side, right? Mm. And so that's kind of a growing process that he goes through where he has to mature to realize that, as is the statement of Ali, is that, uh, is that, Truth is not known by men, meaning that truth is not known by the people who speak it. Rather, men are known by the truth. You take the truth and you apply it, and then you see, okay, is this person true or not, right? The fact we have this problem now, before everything erupted uh, recently, the, the recent escalation in Palestine, we were talking about all these things when it comes to, um, well, this, that's a right-wing talking point, and some Muslims are criticizing some of the things that um, other Muslims were doing when it comes to gender ideology, are saying, well, that's a right-wing talking point. Well, I'm sorry, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. Just the fact that somebody on the right says it, right? We should be able to accept the truth no matter no matter where it comes from. So part of the, the problem is that there's an issue of tribalism, according to some of the discourses that I laid out earlier. There's this us versus them sort of attitude where, where, where many nations, or at least the governments, are looking at Israel and they're saying, well, they're one of us. And so we're willing to look the other way. That's why the one person that I talked to could get to the point where they're, they're worried about possible unconfirmed civilian casualties on one side, um, but they're not willing to condemn chemical weapons used against civilians on the other side, right? That's, that's how we get there. Um, there's also something structurally, right, that when it comes to secular liberalism, there is a necessary violence, right, that comes into play, right? It authorizes, again, it authorizes a type of violence. And some of the early liberal thinkers, they talked about they talked about liberalism as akin to trying to maintain a garden in the jungle, 
right? The jungle is always reaching in to try to grow and overtake the garden. And so you have to take the machete or you have to take the knife and cut in order to, you know, they, they use this imagery um, in order to preserve the garden or the sanctity of the garden. So that's how you can, somebody can get to the point where they look at this type of violence and they say, this is, these are the heroes. These aren't the terrorists. These are the heroes. These are the freedom fighters, right? We know that in that the line, the discursive line between the two, or let's say the materially factual line between the two sometimes is rather thin, but discursively and, and mythologically, sometimes it's, it seems like these two are on completely opposite sides because there's a type of violence that is authorized and deemed necessary, right? And then there's a type of violence which is inconscionable and barbaric, right? So when it comes to liberalism and sort of the world that it's created, the violence that is seen as nonsensical and barbaric is religious violence, is violence for the sake of God, is, is violence, you know, like these types of things, right? Whereas the violence that is seen as completely necessary is the violence to maintain the liberal order, is violence to establish, um, an ethnic nation state is the violence to, you know, this is what people are called to die for and called to kill for, right? And nobody bats an eye. I said, you know, the other week, um, there was a, uh, for one of these holidays, I can't keep them straight in, in the United States, we have Veterans mm. Day and this day and that day, they're all for the military. And in the front of the grocery store, there were beer cans arranged in the, the shape of a tank with with American flags hanging from it. And I took, I had to take a picture on my phone and said, this is the most American thing I've ever seen when it comes to sort of the the just laying bare that this is deemed necessary violence. Our dead are heroes and your dead are are terrorists. Our dead are martyrs and your dead are are heathens or godless folks or whatever. Right. So this is something that we have to be aware of and we can't fall for this idea that, you know, um that liberalism again is 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 somehow more clean or somehow more civilized or somehow more less complicit in these things. It's just about the way that things are packaged and the way that things are perceived. Here in Europe, uh, in particular in, in some countries like France and Germany, uh, we've had blanket bans uh, instituted by the state, uh, bans on uh, pro-Palestinian protests. Now, these are states that um, uh, talk a lot about freedom of speech. The French state, for example, has made a, a, an issue about Muslims and freedom of speech and the lack of freedom of speech that stems from, uh, supposedly stems from Islam. Uh, Macron talked about Islam in crisis. Um, how do we understand uh, why they ban uh, Palestinian protests and, and other things which maybe um, uh, may on face values look like things that should be in accordance with the values of freedom of speech? I mean, how do you account for such, um, such uh, inadequacies, I suppose, in the way they apply this idea? Well, there's a, a stark difference between slogans and reality. Right. And when it comes to any right in a liberal secular nation state, rights are always defined and applied by the state itself. And so the state gets to circumscribe those rights according to the personality of the state. The state is never, and this is something that's a larger conversation when it comes to sovereignty, when it comes to the state, what makes the modern nation state different from other political technologies is that it exists for its own benefit and its own sake. It is the ultimate authority. There is no authority over it. And it has, therefore, unqualified sovereignty in a way that no other sort of political technology before it had, perhaps. And so there is this sort of thing that, you know, the, the, the state of exception, right? And this is something that, that, that Schmidt talked about uh, in, uh, in his books about how this is what defines what is the ultimate authority, who gets to make the state of exception. So we have the, the freedom of speech, the freedom of speech, the freedom of this, the freedom of that, it all sounds good, but then there's always martial law. There's always the suspension of habeas corpus. There's always the removal of rights. There's always the deportation. When the United States uh, kills its own citizens abroad in drone strikes, there's always that state of exception that the state allocates sovereignty to itself to be able to decide, right? So these are, we make the mistake of being naive enough to think that these are aberrations. These are not aberrations. This is actually defining of what a liberal secular nation state is, that it gets to decide when freedom of speech stops. Freedom of speech for certain people, just like Locke said that freedom and equality was for a certain type of person, it wasn't for everybody. And then later people tried to extend it to others. Okay, and you know, like obviously that was an important project, but when it comes to all the rights and freedoms that any liberal state supposedly has, that it always has to go through the state and the state always has their hand on the plug or the hand on the spigot, however you want to imagine it, so that they can turn it off and turn it on 
as deemed necessary according to national interests. Everything comes back to what is in the national interest. And if the personality of the state is such that it feels fundamentally or existentially threatened by some type of free speech that is going on, then you best believe that they're going to stop that free speech. <laughs> that if there's any right that at any second seems like it's going to contradict not even just like jeopardize the material the material existence of the state, but the personality of the state or undermine the personality of the state, then you can bet that it is going to be that right is going to be suspended, broken, revoked, removed, and policed very heavily. Now you talked earlier about the link between race and liberalism. Uh, it's it's really um, jarring to me that um, the way in which the West treats Ukraine and Ukraine the Ukrainian struggle versus the Palestinian struggle, where on face value uh, they seem very similar. You know, there is a, a colonial enterprise that's uh, that's uh, a colonial project that's trying to. Uh, take land away from uh, the principal state, and those who are the natives of that state are fighting back. Uh, yet they see the two in completely different ways. Uh, in fact, here in Europe, uh, Ukrainian refugees are treated very humanely. Whereas if a Palestinian came over on a boat to to the UK, you know they would be treated in horrendous a horrendous way. Um, uh, speak to that uh, a little more, the, the relationship between how race and how that uh, intersects with uh, this liberal paradigm. Just this week, we had a, a confrontation between two French uh, ministers, I believe, in the government, where one of whom was, was black and obviously his ancestors uh, hail from Africa and the other who, who wasn't. And in the heat of the moment, the one said to the other, go back to Africa. Right. So um, we're, we're still living in this moment. It's not something that I don't think we'll ever get past with a man-made ideology, especially not liberalism, because, again, liberalism is structurally tied into racism. How? Because liberalism is also structurally tied into the notion of progress and into evolutionary paradigms. Right. So the idea that civilization advances over time. First, we were you've heard this all in elementary school and secondary school. First, we were hunters and gatherers and then we had agriculture and then we have, you know, empires and now we have nation states. And this represents progress. Back then, we used to uh, be super religious and have superstitions. And then we found secularism and now we're, you know, more enlightened and more rational, et cetera, et cetera. So much of liberalism is predicated upon this notion of progress. Progress cannot be separated from evolutionary models of growth and historically European uh, sort of writings and thinking about this progress has always placed black Africa especially, but all the rest of the world back on that spectrum of progress and down on that supposedly evolutionary model of uh, or model of growth that these people represent barbarity they represent savagery and we supposedly the europeans we take our pride in being advanced and ahead of them right so much of the definite or, or the what the self takes pride in is predicated on this distinction at least we're not like them at least we don't have to live in thatch huts maybe the people in thatch huts are happier than you maybe the people in thatch huts are going to jannah and you're going to taste the fire this is never part of the equation the equation is that what makes us special, where do we, the, the wages, the psychological wages that we pay ourselves is that we are evolved, we're, pr we're progressive, that we're past, we're advanced, and that the rest of the society and the rest of the world is behind us. You cannot separate this from the racialization of this discourse that places everybody outside of Europe and by extension the United States behind and under and uh, and below. Can I ask you about democracy? Um We've been living through a very uh, problematic period, a very uh, a period of turmoil in the Muslim world, where back in 2020, there were revolutions or rebellions against the government and for more representative government. Uh, but uh, if we take what happened after that and, you know, the world before uh, those Arab uprisings, the West has very clearly acquiesced with the dictators, the Arab dictators in the Muslim world. And uh, they've allowed those dictators to to keep a lid on uh, the Muslim masses and to to prevent them from from having a say in their affairs and progressing in life. And um, 
Yeah, I get I get the point you make about you know those systemic uh, inadequacies within liberalism, but how do they justify this um, endorsement of a very undemocratic project in in the Muslim world? Democracy is usually a front. Okay, there there's a difference again between slogan and reality, and if anybody with any ounce of objectivity looks at the historical record, they would conf conclude that democracy is an empty slogan that is only used to authorize violence for whatever reason, whether it's resources, whether it's ideological reasons, class of civilizations, whatever is the actual motive at play, that democracy is almost always wielded as uh, an instrumental tool when it's convenient. And the record is extremely clear. 2006, Hamas was elected in the Gaza Strip. And we all know what happened then. Immediate blockade. The blockade has been going on for 17 years. No, uh, in ways that are collective, amount to collective punishment. No, you know, anything in from humanitarian aid or food or anything like that. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, right? Which was, and we're not talking that these, these movements are perfect. Obviously, all of them have their, their drawbacks, and that's not our concern here. But it was democratically elected, and it scared the pants off of the Western world. And so the Western world moved quickly to try to eliminate, neutralize, and subvert it. Uh, supporting Sisi's coup in Egypt. When it comes to Imran Khan in Pakistan, right? We just have revelations recently that the United States government promised the relief from IMF debts, right? If the Pakistani military would intervene and remove Imran Khan, again, despite what you think of him, it's, we're not here like praising anybody, like uh, you know, 100%. Yeah. Erdogan, right? Again, no matter what you think about him, the United States was ready to support the coup against him. Uh, I believe in 2016 or 2018, whichever year it was, right? So this is a long history you can go back to in every decade. I mean, you know, as somebody who began as a history major and a U.S. history major, uh, the, the record is just crystal clear. If you go back to Iran in the 50s, if you go back to, you know, the quote unquote America's back backyard in, the, in the Latin America, Central America, South America, the United States in particular has always intervened to stop democracy <laughs> whenever the, de the democratically elected governments threatened its either real or perceived interests and that sometimes materialistic interests and sometimes ideological interests. So this is not something, again, that we should think of as, oh, this is an aberration. This is the norm. This is what is actually built into the practice of Western civilization uh, that we have seen. At a certain point, if somebody tells you time and time again that they support this, whether it's fairness, whether it's justice, or it's democracy, but they act contrary. There's a certain point where you have to stop being naive and saying that this person doesn't actually believe in this at all. And I always give the quaint example internally with the United States that we have such poor voter, voter turnout typically. What does it say about su supposed consent of the governed? What if everybody stayed home the next election? Would the government conclude, oh, well, we don't have any legitimacy. We have to pack up and go home. No, it would not. It would not at all. It assumes sovereignty and power for itself. It will seek to stay in power for its own ends, and it will favor democracies or dictatorships or whatever it has to do in order to stay in power and advance its interests. How do you understand the importance of Israel to the West? I mean, this may sound like a naive question, but it just seems sometimes to be implausible. I mean, you know, why would you accept um, such a horrendous apartheid state and unquestionably um, you know, give, give it the green light to to undertake its its actions. That what is the importance of of Israel to Western states? Uh, that's a great question, and I try to make this argument when I when I speak to non Muslims, especially uh, especially folks on the right. Uh, well, there's a, there's a way to talk to people on the right and the left, depending on what you want to emphasize. I basically say that Israel is an ally that the United States can no longer afford. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, many conservatives and people on the right in the United States, they're concerned about tax dollars, they're concerned about spending, they're concerned about these sorts of things. There's a, 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 a small sort of a rivulet of of conservatives and Republicans that are, quote unquote, America first. They don't see the point of the external wars or the the meddling into Middle Eastern affairs or things like that. And when I bring them the numbers that the United States pays the Israeli military $13.1 million a day, which is four times more than we spend on food stamps, four times more than we spend per annum uh, feeding hungry people in the United States, a lot of people are shocked. Um, I know, you know, whatever you think about her, the, the sort of conservative pundit Candace Owens tweeted this late, uh, earlier this week where she said that I don't understand why we're sending military support to help patrol a nation's border. 
a, a foreign nation's border, when these foreign nations don't help us patrol our own borders? Like, what are we getting out of this? So that's a particular argument to use. Um, when it comes to the left, people are usually more stirred by the ideals of sort of fairness and, 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 and justice and oppression and these sorts of things. So that's when you kind of you you hit on how many times the United the United Nations seventy eight times the United Nations has singled out Israel for uh, censure right since its inception, <clears throat> and all of the different Geneva connect, uh, conventions and U.S. or excuse me U.N. Uh, resolutions that it has violated and it's horrible track record for human rights and it's it's open oppression and racism. Um, you know these are things that tend to have more play on the left, but the obstacle is exactly what you refer to in the question, what do people perceive themselves getting out of Israel that they would not just immediately see this logic? And I think there's a couple, there's a couple things. Israel is the West's last colonial outpost, and that's just a fact, uh, both symbolically and materially. So when it comes to symbolic significance, the symbolic significance of Israel is enormous. When it comes to, it is a, a crusader state, in some way, right? The idea of it encroaching upon Jerusalem and taking Jerusalem, quote unquote, back for quote unquote Judeo Christian values is a tempting sort of uh, mythology to believe in. Uh, to have this idea that this is, you know, the the one sort of force for Western values, and that's why Israel is shrewd enough to to um, to capitalize on sort of LGBTQ uh, ideals, and they're sort of prog they're not a progressive state, but they pay lip service to progressive values in their propaganda in order to make it seem like th we are the beacon of light in this area that would otherwise be dominated by cutting of hands and killing and, and all this sorts of things, right? So there's a tremendous amount of symbolic significance <clears throat> that is holding people back from seeing what a liability Israel is. And then there's also a material strategic significance when it comes to having, again, an actual outpost in the Middle East. It is breaking up umatic solidarity. It is stopping supposedly the Muslims from uniting and doing who knows what. Um, it is the classic divide and conquer method. You could also conceive of it as a human shield for the West. Israel is its own frontier. As Israel has settlers that push the frontiers in the West Bank, Israel itself, the entire idea of Israel is a settler in the Middle East, in Arab lands, in Muslim lands. And so the United States arms it just as the Israeli government arms its settlers and its colonizers, the United States arms Israel as a colonizer and as a settler in those borderlands, right? So it has this very, very strategic, uh, strategic significance for, for the West as well. Where does that leave the Muslim community in the United States? Um, it seems to me that you're uh, really stuck between a rock and a hard place. You've got the two parties that are, there's bipartisan support uh, against uh, against Palestine and, and, and a very pro-Israel uh, uh, stance of the two parties, but also in a host of issues, Muslims just find themselves um, outside of the political system. Um, is, the, is there an argument to say that, you know, Muslims need to do better in providing uh, representatives that are going to be able to change the system more to their favor? Yes, and there's no secret that the United States Muslim population has more of a responsibility, I think, than even the the Muslim populations of Europe, because the main nation that is holding up Israel and arming it, of course, is the United States. So if you're going to look at the greatest impact that you can have, then you know it's going to be a game changer if the Muslims of the United States can come together and meaningfully organize uh, in whatever capacity in order to change both the narrative, the thinking, the language, and then eventually the action uh, of the United States government towards the region and towards and towards Israel. Um, mm. It's nothing is impossible. Allah is is qahir and qadir, right? Allah is able to do whatever He wants. And we have, um, there are means available to us, but we are not outnumbered or even outfunded, though the, the funding of the opposition is, is tremendous. We're not outfunded per se, we're outorganized. Um, we have uh, opportunities that we have dropped, and hopefully, hopefully, this recent escalation and all the atrocities is a final wake up call to the Ummah in general and to Muslims in America specifically about the duty and responsibility that we have to our Muslim brothers and sisters in Palestine to attempt to be the ones on the inside that are changing the, the hearts and minds, 
right? And this has already begun to happen, honestly, when you talk to the average person on the ground, uh, when you talk to the people who get their news more through social media, you know, the cracks in the narrative, they're starting to show. Everybody has made sort of uh, observations of very accurate observations. The things that people are saying now, you couldn't imagine people saying 20 years ago. It was not possible. Um, there was such a stranglehold on the discourse 20 years ago that it has, it's, we have a we have a fighting chance now when it comes to make you know sharing things and putting things in the news and putting things in front of people's eyes even questioning it's unprecedented and 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 you know again Sammy has has broken this down far better than I can far more eloquently but even to get major news stations to apologize this is unprecedented this has never happened before where mm -hmm. people are now holding the news and the politicians accountable people challenging politicians in gas stations on their little tours that they make to try to, you know, for photo ops and things like that. Like this is a democratization of information, a democratization of platform and media that actually is a tremendous opportunity. We are taking advantage of it. We have to keep taking advantage of it and actually do even more to the point where we're able to change people's hearts and minds, trust that most people actually want to do the right thing that they need to be educated, they need to be demonstrated, they need to be shown something better, and then take the people who are willing to work with us and find a way forward from there. I often hear commentators uh, talk about the deep-seated hatred, uh, in particular Europeans have against Islam, and they talk about uh, almost like an intergenerational hatred. Um, do you regard this to be somewhat exaggerated and you know somewhat of a hyperbole or uh, or do you believe that uh, such a hatred can exist after so many generations, so many centuries after the Crusades? Yeah, it certainly exists and it certainly can. And this is why discourse and mythology is extremely important because people make sense of things how they're mythologized, right? So when people talk about even calling, um, the, kicking out the Muslims and Jews from Spain, the Reconquista, right, which is the reconquering, it sets the whole stage like it should have been ours in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. So these things, this is where we have an opportunity actually to intervene and to change the language. And the way, you know, if you're able to win the language battle and the terms upon which the discussion happens, then you're able to set yourself up to to win discursively and, and win hearts and minds eventually. Um, you have to give people an opportunity to see the truth. You have to try to level the playing field. So even though it is a challenge, I wouldn't say that it's a prohibitive or a preventative challenge. It's one that can be overcome, but it's one that it's one that requires uh, strategy and intentionality, and it requires us to also be on our best behavior, right? We set ourselves back when we as Muslims play into the tropes and play into sort of some of the bad stereotypes. Um, so we have, I'm not going to say, I think it's an exaggeration to say we have no one to blame but ourselves. I think that's a little too apolitical. Um, but it's it's an ingredient and it's a factor, right? So we have to simultaneously work inside and work outside. We have to work on ourselves to live up to the ideals that we believe in and the Islam that we know is true. And we also have to demonstrate, right? Qawlan baligha, right? Allah says in Surah Tanisa, right? Is that to give them something that is, uh, that is eloquent, right? Something that is eloquent speech that is able to convince them and able to persuade them that this is something that can be overcome and, and, and people people who are sincere will see. People who are sincere, I think, will come around. Shala. And um, uh, what you're calling for is really an, an Islamic-based activism, uh, an activism that's rooted in Islam. Now, until now, in particular, when we think about Palestinian activism, a lot of it does belong to or is undergirded by Western ideologies. So you've got those who believe in liberal equality or those uh, progressives who believe in anti-imperialism or Marxism. Um, how easy is it to develop a, a Palestinian movement or, an, or a, a movement in favor of Palestine uh, or other Muslim causes that are rooted in the Islamic faith? This is an extremely important issue that not very many people are talking about. And maybe these discussions need to happen more offline than online, but they definitely need to happen. 
um, because we have some uh, we have some risks, we have some obstacles uh, when it comes to our own ranks. Um, some of those obstacles, uh, Sammy was talking about last night on our live stream with Yachin Institute when it comes mm -hmm. to the defeatist mentality, right? This is something that this learned helplessness that we sort of inherited from being colonized, that we can't do it, that we're, uh, we're so backwards and we're so in our way and there's nothing I can do. And there, you know, we're too out far outnumbered and we might as well just give up and it's not really our issue and, or the blaming issue, like, like this is how come you didn't care about, you know, police brutality? How come you didn't care about, Kashmir, how come you didn't care about this issue? Now you expect me to care for Palestine, right? These are, these are divide and conquer tactics. These are divide and conquer tactics that come from our colonizers and our oppressors, and we have to be very, very aware of them. In addition to these, the secular activism is also something that needs to be navigated with, ve with like, very, very carefully. Um, people, uh, you know, colonialism is like, is like a zombie apocalypse, right? Once you get bit by the zombie, you become a zombie. And so this is kind of the classic, uh, what they call the post-colonial problem, right? You've got uh, people who have been colonized, and part of the colonization, it, it, if only it were simply material, if only it were simple, simply bodies and, and resources, that would be much easier. But it's also hearts and minds, it's also ideology, it's also about the way that you think about the world. And so once you have internalized colonization, then you have the Qaruns of the world, right? You have sellouts, you have people that the opposition is going to be able to tempt with position and money and status in order to sell out the cause. And then you also have uh, this phenomenon of people who mean well, but they think to use some some lefty language that they can dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. And those who are on the left will know exactly which book I'm referring to. You cannot dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. You have to use your own tools, right? And so this is something that we can have a conversation and we really need to do more because I can at least speak for, for the U.S. Uh, you know, uh, uh, situation or the U.S. context. When I look at the organizations that are backing the biggest protests, they're not the, the ICNAs and the ISNAs and they're not the, the, the self-described religious organizations. They are mostly the ethnic-based organizations and some of them are quite secular or some of them are, are they don't, they're not moving from an umatic frame. They're not moving from a, uh, Islam as the foundation of what they're coming from. And that's going to have extreme uh, consequences down the line. <clears throat> you're going to be able to be bribed. You're going to be able to be bought. You're going to be able to, to sell out. You're going to be able to be corrupted if you don't root your activism in the divine guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's only a matter of time because the secular model divorces morality and ethics from your activism. You think that you're just going to, de de you know, you derive your sense of righteousness from your ethnicity or for who you are or from your historical experience. Of course, all of that gives you, you know, the the platform to talk and the experience. But if you do not temper that with the relationship from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, devotion to Him, sincerity towards Him, Allah will not put blessing in what you do. And Allah will not guide you to the success, right? So we have to be extremely careful about this. We need to actually have these behind closed doors conversations with the more secular activists and talk about do da'wah, right? And that doesn't mean that we don't work with other people. That doesn't mean that we're, you know, being divisive. No, this is a time for unity. This is the time to be together. This is the time to act together. But we're going in blind. We're going in blind if we think that this isn't going to create problems down the road. You know, there's a... Um, there's sort of a historical truth to this, right? That every insurrectionist movement or sort of revolutionary movement is actually quite a diverse coalition of actors with different types of beliefs, and that's of necessity. But then once it comes into power or it achieves its goal, then the moment flips and now everybody falls into infighting because now you have to come up with a positive vision for what's going to actually happen. I had a professor teach uh, you know, an undergraduate course on the Iranian revolution um, when I was uh, at Vassar. And you know, this was something that sh surprised me. When you hear about the Iranian revolution, you know, and we're not talking about judging it good, bad, et cetera, we're just describing it historically. In the insurrectionist phase before it attained power, it was not simply Islamic. There were Marxists, there were uh, you know radicals, there were feminists, there were all these different sectors of society that had grievance with the Pahlavi regime, right? That unified together to kick him out, and then through the sort of you know the birth pangs of the revolution, different you know uh, sectors sort of outmaneuvered one another, and one particular sort of segment of the population outmaneuvered everybody else and grabbed power for themselves. All that to say, 
we have to be extremely careful and we have to think. We want to shore up our ranks. We don't want them to become a liability down the road. The opposition is going to try to break us up in any possible way. They are terrified. They're terrified of seeing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people in the streets. They are going to resort to anything to break us up. We had one professor at Vassar who taught a course on sort of uh, revolutionary politics or, or, or social movements. And one of the, there was like a group project or presentation and, and one of their presentations was to take over the class. So the idea was that they were going to remove the professor and they were now the professors. And the professor was very smart. The professor said to them, how come you, you're all men? And all of a sudden they started fighting and all the women in the class all of a sudden spoke up and said, hey, that's not fair. Why aren't we? And it broke their ranks just in an instant. We have to be ready for that moment. So we have to be very, very, very deliberate and very have foresight and start to think about what are the chinks in our armor? What are our weaknesses? What are our liabilities? And how can we sort of patch them up? What can we do to, um, to move forward and to put us to strengthen our position and to not lose the amazing momentum that we have achieved thus far? Finally, Imam Tom, you sound very um, optimistic and very positive, but I've met plenty of Muslims in this past week who feel very deflated and they feel that uh, the world is full of oppression and it's difficult, it's impossible now to to fight this oppression. And we've got to a stage now where Muslims are not just being persecuted in Palestine. Just this day, we're seeing uh, Russia bomb uh, positions in Idlib and kill innocent civilians once again. Uh, we've got Muslims who are languishing in concentration camps in in uh, in East Turkestan, uh, the Uyghur Muslims. We've got Muslims in uh, in camps who've been there for decades now, the Burmese, the Rohingya Muslim. Uh, in countries like uh, India, we've got a slow and steady genocide taking place against the Muslim Ummah. Everywhere we look, we find that Muslims are being persecuted. Have we now got to a point, I mean, in the words of a, a brother I met after after Salah, you know, we've got to the point where the day of judgment is near. And um, the implication from that was there's nothing now we can do about it. And we just have to wait and see for Allah's judgment. When it, This is why uh, rooting your activism in Islam is essential. Because with all of the stories that we draw on and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks uh, in the Quran or speaks in the Quran about the Battle of Badr, right? And how they were outnumbered and how they were out-equipped and how they were out-funded. And yet, what they had was the sincerity and they had the taqwa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala figured out the how. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down angels and he brought down a restful sleep and he brought down rain to purify them and and shore up their ranks. When at the end of Surah Al-Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the, the, the person who comes and says, they've gathered up in, in opposition to you, right? Mm -hmm. This is the naysayer, right? And they say like their their forces are too strong, like like this is terrible. What how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe the believer that it increases them in faith? It increases them in faith because that's the difference between us and materialists. That's the difference between Muslims and secularists. We don't just believe that one is equal to one. One can be more than one. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts barakah in that one, that one is worth a million. Right, which is why we have sort of this divine calculus of, you know, we're not allowed to retreat on the battlefield if the numbers are this and that and the third, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it literally that this number of you is able to face that number of, of the opponent, right? So, you know, capitalist logic thinks that everything is just substitutable in numbers and numbers and ones and zeros. You know, capitalist logic imagines, okay, well, you have, you know, these guns and bombs and planes and etc. There's still human beings behind those. There's still hearts that have to pull the trigger. There's still hearts that have to, you know, press the button. And you can change hearts, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change hearts. If Allah Azza wa can have Musa alayhi salam grow up in his own oppressor's house, Fir'aun, and grow up to overthrow him, the very means that Fir'aun had chosen to, 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 to avoid his fate became the very means by which he was undone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do it, right? Like, so this is something that our belief is essential. And our optimism is something that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved. He loved optimism. We're not naive. We're not stupid. We have to be frank and sober when it comes to the opposition and, and the sort of forces and the liabilities and the, the threats to our unity and all the things that we're up against. But we can never give up or underestimate 
the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he wants to achieve something, he will. When he wants to achieve something, what does Allah say in the Quran? He says he took the lowest of people, which is Bani Israel, and he wanted to give them support so that they would inherit the earth and become those who were who were above, right? He made a sign out of them. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Quran to the Arabs and united the Arabs who were perhaps the most tribalistic people, he made a sign out of them. Look at how they demolished the Persian Empire and they went and demolished the Byzantine Empire all in a matter of years. It defies materialistic logic. It defies secularistic logic because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can intervene. We call that a miracle and miracles are possible. We believe in miracles. The first quality or characteristic Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the person who has taqwa in the Quran and Surah Al-Baqarah, the people who believe in the unseen, that there are things in this world that are unseen that we do not know about, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing them, right? And so this is fundamental. This is foundational. This is what separates us. This is why the United States wants to fund religious extremists, quote unquote, as opposed to the secular extremists when it came to, you know, the Central Asia and Afghanistan or whatever, because they understood that the people who fight for a religious cause, the people who fight for the afterlife, we have something that nobody else does. We have the persistence. We have the stories. We, have, we are able to sacrifice. We're able to put our bodies on the line, that our money on the line, and everything on the line, as long as we believe that we are obtaining the pleasure and approval of our Lord, that we are willing to sacrifice everything. And nobody else is going to do that. Nobody else is willing to pay that price. The end of Surah At-Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the believers are those who have purchased. They've purchased their spot in the afterlife because of what they have, what they have paid. Right? They go out and they strive. We're ready to make the fastab shiru bi-bayikum. Right? Like, so glad tidings with what you've exchanged. Right? The, the, once you have faith in the heart, you're ready to make that exchange time and time and time again. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put that thabat in our hearts, to put that motivation and that optimism and that carefulness, because it's still, this is not naivety. We're still sober. We're still, we're still alert. We're still awake. We're looking and we're, we're aware to give us what we need. But once we've crossed our T's and dotted our I's and we've prayed our night prayers and we've been sincere and we've taken care of everything we, we need to do, at a certain point, we have to trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take care of the way and he's going to open up a way from which we had no idea, right? In a way that we can't even anticipate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do it. He's done it many times before. He has told us in his book that he's done it. And we have good thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Tom Fakine, Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much. I very much valued our conversation today. Thank you. Amin wa It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Barakallah fiqh. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.